Okay, well, folks, here we go, and welcome to another exciting episode of the Mind, Body, and Soul podcast with John Morris. Today, we are back in sunny Scotland, and I invite you to join me as I catch up with a dear friend of mine, internationally travelled Scottish musician, Scott Nicol. Join us as we talk about Scott's journey as a musician, his battles and struggles through life, how faith was a lifesaver for him, and how the work he does with youths and teens has been a game changer for many. All that and so much more on today's episode of the Mind, Body and Soul podcast with John Morris. Welcome to the Mind, Body and Soul podcast with John Morris. Inspiring, motivating and educating you in finding balance in the craziness of day-to-day life. Learn from and listen to a man who has a wealth of life experience, from business to bodybuilding, artist to author, and has learned to deal with his own physical and mental wellness. But that's not all. Each week John interviews and picks the minds of special guests from all around the world and from all walks of life. From actors to authors, wrestlers to warriors, business owners to life coaches, and so much more. Welcome to today's episode of the Mind, Body, and Soul podcast with John Morris. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls and children of all ages, welcome to another exciting episode of the Mind, Body, and Soul podcast. I am, as always, your host, John Morris, and welcome to the show that helps you find balance in the craziness of day-to-day life, and we do this through inspirational, motivational, and educational content. My guest today is one of my longest and dearest friends. My guest today (laughs) is one of an amazing, amazing line of great musicians. He is singer-songwriter Scotland's own, none other than Scott Nicholl. Scott, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? I'm doing pretty good today, and I'm I'm honoured to be on your show. Thank you so much. It is an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Yes. Well, yours was one of the first names that I sat and thought of, you know, again, somebody that's got a lot of experience, a lot of story to tell. Um, I believe, in fact, this is the first time that you and I have done a sit down interview uh, in, in this, uh, I suppose, niche, as it were, which is going to be really exciting for me. So, Scott, for the audience that maybe don't know about you, share with them a little <laughs> bit about yourself and what it is that you do. Well, I would say I'm a... I'm- Probably a number of things, but it's all uh, mainly related to music. Um, so I'm a singer-songwriter. Um, I've had a career, I suppose, still have a career. Yeah. <laughs> I've got I've got a music business um, called Possibility Screams, and basically I teach guitar and get the chance to work with great, I would say, kind of like up-and-coming young artists yeah. and And I've written many songs with them, been in the studio with them. In fact, just at the weekend there, I was in the studio in Glasgow with two young young girls, one at 12 and one at 16, original songs recording. So, you know, back in the day, do you remember when there used to be gigs? Yeah, yeah, I I remember those days. (laughs) I remember them well. (laughs) Well, um, I play a lot of live gigs, but also I put on events and... One of the other things I do is like my young people that I've just mentioned, and, and not always young people, but I, I'll put on an event and, and let, give them a chance to perform in front of an audience. So I do a whole range of things, but kind of music related. Um, that, and, I, and I've had the privilege of traveling. Um, a yeah, bit, definitely. You know, I've had the privilege of, I played in America many, many times. Um, I, I played, you know, like I, I could rattle off other places, but so. I suppose I've got quite a good experience in the whole, I suppose, in, in, in music from in, in different levels. So yeah, abs- absolutely. I, 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 hope, I hope that was semi-explanatory. No, I, absolutely. You know, and it, and it is. We we had a, a, two of the guests that have been on this week that went so far into depth that it was like 10 minutes into the show. And I was like, you've just done my entire show for me. It was brilliant. Wow. But no, wow. Scott, that was fantastic. Um, I want to ask you as well <laughs> about your early life. What was what was a young Scott Nickel like? Were, were you always interested in music or was there other things that caught your attention as well? The young Scott Nickel was, um, I was actually quite a wild young guy, I actually was. and I, got I can't into, believe that about you. <laughs> well, I actually got 
into trouble with the police. And I must say, I, I, I literally, I must have broke my mother and father's heart because I did some things I shouldn't have been doing. And the young, the young Scott Nicker was, I was definitely into football and uh, I loved music. I don't think I loved music like I want to be a musician. Yeah. I just loved it. Um, I remember loving David Bowie back in the day and, and, uh, I got into the punk rock scene. I loved the mm-hmm. Clash. I was I, actually my first band was a punk rock band. We were we were terrible, <laughs> but, <laughs> but but you know I, I look back and with fondness now you think you know we, we rehearsed three of us in a small hut. You could hardly get the three of us in. Was like, <laughs> but but you know I look back in the in the, the life of had in music and it was it was a start. You know so. Um, one of the things, I mean, not the one of the things, but a really life-changing thing for me was as a young man, and we all need this, but I really needed it. I, I, I became a Christian. I wasn't in a, brought yeah. up in a Christian home. I was brought up in a really good home, really good moral, had a great mother and father. They're both passed on now and great sisters, um, but not a religious family in any way. Yeah. And, and when I was a young man, I became a Christian, and honestly, John, my life altered from yeah. that day. And, and the power of that mm-hmm. still still resonates in my life to this day. So um, I don't want to be heavy about this, but, you know, I potentially was heading for prison in the yeah. life of the way I was living. Yeah. You'd go into more details in that. And mm-hmm. thankfully, I'm really grateful that, uh, that, that the, the Lord really got me out of that and, and set me on a, a new path. Absolutely. And, and it's always interesting because um, that there's been several folks that we're, we're going to have on the show um, that are, you know, and have more of a faith story. Um, and that, that's always fascinating because, again, the stories that come out are so powerful. Um, yes. You know, and, and like you say, you know, I think... Because, again, you know, you, you and I have traveled briefly together um, when I was doing gigs and uh, you know the, the the car crash that those sometimes were in in my own learning you know um, process, but you know I, I always found it interesting the people that you'd meet and you know the conversations that you'd have and obviously you and I you know know a variety of people that had been in prison and have come out of prison and all talk about you know their you know how God had come into their life and I think God yeah. comes into life with people in very very different ways. Some people need that you know you know, a Paul on the road to Damascus kind of moment. Other people just need that more subtle, um, you know, kind of approach to it. What I want to ask you, obviously, with um, the faith aspect to your life, I know, again, you will touch on this uh, a little bit more in, in a moment, but how did that affect the way that you began to write music and, and thinking about that? Well, I think I was a bit, I, I did write songs from, I think the age of about ten. I okay. mean, it's not like it's not like today, in the because I work with young people today. And yeah. if you had a ten-year-old, I work with people that are eight-year-old and nine-year-old. And nowadays, we're more in tune with the creative aspect yeah. of young people. Yeah. And what to and what to do with that and how to guide that. Yeah. Uh, I'm a I'm a good bit older than you, John. <laughs> and honestly, by but back in my day, um, I wouldn't say there'd be there'd be no um, I wouldn't say there'd be nobody who was interested in doing that. But it was a lot more rare to, yeah. to take somebody at a young age and help mold that into potentially the yeah. future. So when I was writing lyrics or poems or as a young guy, I probably had no thought of any. There's no chance ever wouldn't even enter my head that I yeah. could be a full-time musician, a singer, a songwriter, uh-huh. or something like that. So um, I can remember, though, when I was young, writing, and I had ideas and lyrics. and uh, But to, to get serious about it, I never really got serious as a songwriter, um, probably till I was in my 20s. Okay. Although I had written songs. Yes. Yeah. Um, and, and I would say I was probably a little bit of a late bloomer in the sense that although I was playing guitar from I was 13, I was in a punk rock band when I was like 15. Yeah. I, w- I was not serious about it until yeah. prob- probably late 20s. And okay. 
you know, I'm not ex even exactly sure when that would be. And what happens in the music industry, and I understand this more now because I'm in the music industry, mm -hmm. there is a point where, as, as far as making it, it was probably over for, for me at late yeah. 20s. Uh -huh. I'm not I'm not saying it wasn't over for me in being good. I could still be good and be talented course, yeah. and do it well. But I think most of the people you see today who are still have an amazing following in the 60 years of age, these people were famous when they were like 21 yeah. or 22 or 23, and their fans have went with them. Yeah. So so um um, I, I'd, I would be, I think, mid-30s, early 30s before I was actually in a band. I was a front man of a band who I, who were really, really good. It was probably yeah. the first really good ensemble of musicians mm -hmm. I was with. And probably for the first time in my life, I realized I'm actually pretty decent at yeah. what I do. And, and I'm pretty good, decent yeah. front man. Mm -hmm. So... Um, I, the young Scott Nicker was pretty rowdy. Jesus changed me, and and uh, but I never really got serious about songwriting, as I say, till about late twenties. And then you're into your thirties. I was in a band called Ten Miles Tall. They were the yeah. first band that uh, I, I thought every musician was terrific. It was like what well, it was like that. You just went up another level. Yeah. Um, so that was maybe the start of becoming kind of serious about okay. music and making albums and and in and in some ways, um, excuse me if I'm repeating myself here. Okay. But in, in, in some ways, from a making it point of view, you know, really is somebody going to sign you at 35? Yeah. I don't know. I mean, you know, it's it, it's uh, you know obviously uh, looking at from the other side of things as well with the business aspect you know again somebody that's going to sign any star or talent or anything is thinking longevity because they're always absolutely. thinking you know that return on investment and everything. You talked yeah. about um, you, the, the rowdy Scott Nickel. Talk to us a little bit about that, if you will, and some of your journey. Um, I suppose, you know, because again, and the reason I bring this up is because I know we've got a lot of folks watching this that have got kids um, that at some point in their life may be faced with decisions of going down wrong paths and wrong avenues and temptation, obviously, is out there everywhere now. We talked about this earlier on um, in other interviews as well. And I think it really helps people to sit and actually think, okay, if I do what I'm about to do, am I still going to enjoy it in 60 minutes from now or 30 minutes from now, whatever it is? Yeah, yeah. And sometimes that's a, a really, really positive way to, to, I suppose, in looking at your decisions. What was it for you that you found to be, you know, the, the times of temptation? Was it friends? Was it social peers? Was it just your own desires and everything that was there? <laughs> that's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, well, do you know, when I, when I look back, um, I didn't have anything. Do you know, I, I didn't come out of a, dis, a dysfunctional family yeah. in any shape or form. Mm -hmm. I mean, my mother and father remained married till the day they, they died. When okay. I wasn't, a, there was no, I never, I never remember feeling unloved. In fact, the path I went down, I don't think had a ref, reflection one bit of yeah. the house I was brought up in. So for me, and I can only speak for my own yeah. self, I suppose there was a, I wanted excitement, I think as a young man. Yeah. And I probably like, you know, I, I'm ashamed to say this, but I was involved in like planned break-ins. It was okay. like petty, petty crime, yeah. which was head, potentially heading towards word worse things. Uh -huh. And that's why... I think I can quite categorically say I was really saved for prison. I think yeah. I could have been heading for prison. So, but I think I wanted excitement. And when you're young, you don't think through yeah. the consequences of what you're doing. Now, one of the things I had said there, I've been in America many, many times. Mm -hmm. Had I gone down a route to being in prison, yeah. that could even stop you from getting into certain countries. Correct. Yeah. Because you, and that is, I, John, I'm serious about this. Yeah. I am so thankful yeah. that I don't actually have a prison record, although I had been in the police yeah, yeah. station on a few yeah. occasions. Thankfully, I don't have anything. Yeah. Maybe I was too, too young, or maybe it was just a different 
time or whatever, but I don't have a police record. I think that's something... So, so, Sorry, go on. So, so, so just really on that, you know, mm. temptation is the immediate. You see something, you want it, I want it. Now, if you can pull yourself back a little bit and say, well, what is yeah. the consequences, the potential consequences of my actions here? Because you may, you may frighten yourself into yeah. not doing it. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And I think, you know, that there's a difference. We'll talk about this a little bit in the book, uh, which we'll talk about later on. Um, you know, the, the difference between being passive and, and reactionary. And I think sometimes people are too reactionary these days. They just make a decision based yeah. on how they feel as opposed to how yeah. they, you know, how they think and everything. Um, and I completely agree with you there. I mean, you know, for anybody that's ever been in a police station, you know, that's enough to scare you. But what a lot of people don't recognize is, you know, it takes quite a serious thing for the police to then say, right, we need to act on this and we yeah. need to basically charge a person. You know, uh, police in a lot of ways get a, a bad rep a lot of the time. Um, so. You know, and I think, you know, for, for any anyone that's been there, like I say, sometimes it's miscommunication. Sometimes it's, you know, having to tell the other side of the story. Sometimes it's being a witness, whatever it is, it's an environment that you don't want to be there <laughs> too often. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. And I would hope for anybody with what Scott said, obviously what I'm saying as well, but really, really think about, you know, what this next step is for you. Because like Scott was saying, um, you know, if, if you have a criminal record, it limits so much in your life. And again, yeah, yes. the tempt temptation's everywhere. But as Scott was saying, if you can pull yourself away from that, you know, and just mm -hmm. stop and think, right, how's this going to affect your family? How's it going to affect your friends? How's it going to affect essentially how people look at you and respond to you? Yes, um, yes. And, you know, you know be, being able to say I wasn't in the right frame of mind, I wasn't this, I wasn't that, is one thing. But regardless of that, people are going to look at you, your name, and see criminal record next to it. And that's yeah. that's you in a box, unfortunately. That's how people think a lot of the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Scott, um, you know, again, like you say, you know, your, your life was changed. I want to ask you what the moment for you where, you know, it, it was kind of like that come to Jesus moment, that the wake up call where you were like, ah, if I continue down this path, you know, a, a lot of bad things are going to happen. Was it literally like a, a fall on the road to Damascus kind of moment for, for you? It, it was for me personally. Um, again, you know, I said there, I said a bit ashamed to say this. Uh, I, I, the, the turning point for my life, and, and although I've been forgiven and I don't feel yep. any guilt over this, I actually stole money out of a church building. Wow. You're the second person I've heard do that. <laughs> but, John, that was actually the turning point in my life. Right. Because um, it wasn't a lot of money, but that, but that is irrelevant. Um, I, I didn't. I didn't need God to tell me don't yeah. steal money out of church. I had enough of an upbringing. Mm -hmm. I had enough of a conscience. I had enough of, you know, morality in my life to know that is wrong. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. But after I did it, not immediately, but just I think just a short while after I did it. I could not shake this out of my mind that that was wrong. I should not have done this. Mm -hmm. Now, if I'd looked across my whole life at that point, you could definitely have said I was involved in other things that were actually worse than yeah. that. But I wasn't losing sleep over them. Yeah. It was the church thing. It was uh -huh. the church. It was the church. And I know now, I didn't know then, but I know now it was God just like gently... Mm -hmm whispering yeah it was the lord himself um and i eventually i don't know how long it took i don't know if it was a few weeks or days or whatever but i eventually got down on my knees now i was a rough rough guy doing a lot of things i should not mm -hmm. have done that uh thankfully i've been forgiven for today my life's been radically changed but I got down on my knees in my bedroom and asked for forgiveness to God because some way I, I equated, wait a minute, I stole out of God's house, I better apologise yeah. to God. Uh, so as in, in some way that message got through and uh, I, I mean, everything didn't change overnight, but that was a start for me. 
Yeah. That, so so in, in many ways, the worst thing, morally, I think what, it was probably the worst thing to actually steal out of church, yeah. um, was in one say that was the, was the turning point for mm -hmm. my life. That, that's fantastic. And, and again, you know, so many people have similar stories like that. The, the worst part in yeah. their life, the, the valley times, as it were, ends up leading to, you know, pastures green and, and, and plentiful, yeah. um, which is, is just incredible. And obviously, you know, your life has been changed, still is being changed, as, as we talk about, um, you know, and, and obviously you went on to do and still doing phenomenal things now. You start going into your 20s, like you say, and, you know, your music career is really starting to somewhat take shape and starting to develop. And uh, you're playing in various bands and you're doing different things. At what point did you start saying, you know, I, I, I'm enjoying doing this. I maybe want to write more songs. What were the inspirations around you at that time for, for the career that you were pursuing? Well, I think when people ask about the inspiration for songwriting, um, I actually, I actually teach. I, I'm, I'm reluctant to say the phrase "I teach songwriting" because yeah. I, I, I don't know if you actually teach songwriting. I think what you do is you tap into the creativity. I, I like to think I tap into the creativity that's in someone, and I help bring that out. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if I can actually. I can teach you to write a song. I don't know if I can teach you to write a good song. Yeah, I, that's what it comes from. The, that's that um, come from the gift that's in you. So I think the gift was always in me. Mm -hmm. I don't know where it came from. I know it was from the Lord, but I don't know. It didn't come from any part of my, you know, my family. My yeah. mother wasn't a singer. My dad wasn't a singer. You know, so the, the gift was there. Um, I, I'm going to answer your question. It may be in a roundabout <laughs> way, but, but, you know, there's an old picture of me when I was like two years of age. And I'm standing in our living room with a tennis racket for a guitar. And I'm singing into a broom handle like a microphone. <laughs> I kid you not, I'm like two years of age. And I, I'm amazed at that picture now because that is the story of my life. Yeah. And I was two years of age. And my mum tells me that I used to get the, the pots and pans out and sit and drum. <laughs> it was like Ringo Starr out the Beatles. Now, where does that come from yeah. other than God? Mm -hmm. Do you know the, the gift that's in you? Um, so wh when you, you talk about ins inspiration, I think inspiration for songs, for me, um, comes. it can come from just such a wide range of things. Yeah. John, I've written, I've written for like charities. I've written for like about, you know, I wrote for Hope for Justice for like modern day mm -hmm. slavery. I've written obviously out and out worship songs about Jesus and God. I've written like rock songs. I've played in you know bands. I've been in. I've I've, I've played in many different places. But um, you can get inspired from. I think if you're a writer, I am always. My mind is open. My ear is open yeah. all the time for subject matter and. Phrases. It could be today something you said. Yeah. It could be on that. Do you struggle with motivation? Feel yourself procrastinating a lot? Have amazing ideas and dreams, but struggle with the concepts of how to get from where you are to where you want to be? Or maybe looking for something a little bit simpler, like wanting to get fit, or maybe wanting to lose a few pounds and tighten things up. Are you someone that struggles with anxiety or trauma or even depression? You're not alone, many people around the world do. Hi folks, I'm John Morris. Um, for the last two decades, I've been working with people from all over the world in all walks of life to really understand human beings, the concept, the behaviors, and ultimately the reasons why. And I've had the privilege of coaching and working with folks just like you, that maybe are struggling with anxiety or depression or trauma, or wanting to get ahead, wanting to maybe build some long-term success, but have no idea how to begin. This is what I do. And with John Morris Life Coaching, you're in really, really good hands. Why can I say this? Because you're not only gonna get an experienced life coach, you're also gonna get somebody that has a wide variety of experiences from youth ministry and working with teenagers and children to someone who's worked with drug addicts and alcoholics, people that have day-to-day -day dependency issues, to, to somebody maybe just like you that just wants that little bit of encouragement, wants that little bit of motivation, and wants support to get to that next level. 
With John Moore's personal life coaching, you're in really good hands. A lot of my clients would tell you if they were here now that one of the greatest assets to John Morris Life Coaching is you can see things exactly as you want to see them without fear of being controlled and conformed like a lot of therapists and coaches do. We help you right where you're at to get to the place that you want to be, step by step, to figure out a plan. So if this sounds like something that you would be interested in, having that support, motivation, encouragement, and even education, should you need it, then get in touch with me today. I would love to hear from you. Places are limited, so please don't delay. We've got a very, very small window of opportunity remaining. We all need help from time to time, but the difference between success and failure, achieving our dreams and maybe just letting our dreams go by, depends on the level of help that we have available and that we're willing to accept. So get in touch with me today at John Morris Life Coaching. You'll be glad you did, and I'll see you soon. Painting that you did, it's mm -hmm. lovely, just behind the arm, the arm facing. So I think if you're gifted, and I hope that doesn't sound arrogant, but I no, feel no. that there's a gift of songwriting mm -hmm. in me. Yeah. You, you're you're tuned yeah. to certain words and, and ways, and you just kind of, oh, I'll save that in there for later. Mm -hmm. And then at some point you'll put pen to paper. I'm sure it's like you with art. Um, you'll get inspired about why, mm -hmm. you know, why did you write that painting? Why not? I have got lyrics. I have written far more lyrics than I've ever put to music. Yeah. And I probably get better sets of lyrics sitting somewhere that I haven't put to music. <laughs> but something somewhere draws me to a certain subject matter. Yeah. I, I um, agree. Yeah. I, I'm, it's, that, it's that discernment. Yeah. I, I think absolutely. Because I found that certainly uh, when I was writing the book that we talked about um, earlier on, The Battles We All Face, uh, which you can pre order at thebattlesweallface.com. What did you call it? The Battle? Say that again. The, 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 battle, title? the Battles We All Face. Um, I and, and I agonized over that title for ages because, and again, it was only when I was sitting outside uh, in the back garden, sitting on my swing, and literally sitting there thinking, what is the core message of this book? And it was people mm -hmm. that had anxiety, people that were suffering with depression, people that were suffering with letting go, enjoying the moment, you know, and, and so many other things that were going along. And I suppose the core message was reminding people they're not alone. Um, and that for me was what really triggered. But the funny thing was, towards the end of the book, I was absolutely exhausted after one of the chapters uh, called Once Broken, Never the Same. Because when we go through a lot of trauma, a lot of struggles, a lot of difficulties, the same with you know, your relationship with God and with Jesus and the Holy Spirit, it can go the other way. You know, when we go through really traumatic times, it changes who we are. And I was sitting there and I was exhausted. And I just remember... Every single time I would go out there and probably two days straight, God would whisper into my ear a specific phrase, a specific title, and I'd be in and out and in and out and in and out. So the last 10 chapters of the book was written pretty quickly. Um, it was incredible. Uh, and, and like you, you know, when you were saying about the paintings, it used to be that sometimes you hear a word or a phrase and it conjured up an image in your mind. Yes. And all yeah. of a sudden you end up with a painting or, or, or whatever it may be. I wanted to ask you as well, um, when you start having in quote unquote success, what was that like for you? How old was you uh, at that point? And how did you deal with the success, I suppose, that comes as a, as a musician? Well, well I, wouldn't, I wouldn't really consider myself that successful. <laughs> well, we're uh, talking today, you know, so you must be. <laughs> Uh, do you know, I, I, I kind of have a, a laugh sometimes because people, I, I've been in quite a few situations where people will say, are you famous? <laughs> They'll say, are you famous? And I always say the same answer. I say, if you've got to ask if I'm famous, I'm not. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, well, I suppose um, certainly localised and maybe in more in Scotland, you know, a lot of people yeah. know me and they, they, they know, know my music and or, or know my musical kind of exploits. Um, how did I deal with that? Well, I, I, I think for me, again, it comes back to, you know, your, your, your grounding. If, I think, you know, the Bible simply says <clears throat> every good and perfect gift comes from above. Yeah. 
So if you if you if you're going around without God and saying I am the man, you know everything mm-hmm. that I do, it's for me, it's for me, it's for me. I'm great. You know, I think you've got it wrong. <laughs> uh, so I think grounding is great in realizing mm-hmm. that. Well, if I'm good at something, okay, I need to I need to hone that skill. Yeah. There's practical things I can do to get better. But the actual gift, if you realize, well, I've just been blessed in the Lord, I think it keeps you, well, it should keep you yeah. relatively hum- humble. Mm-hmm. So, uh, and I think, I know this can sound really cliched, even, you know, in today's world, but I I, I really believe in, in counting your blessings and actually yeah. being thankful. Yeah. And, and I think all that, kind of thing grounds you in not being arrogant as a person and not being big-headed when you Mm -hmm. just are thankful yes i i think that's a great answer and i think that's something a lot of people forget is you know again to look around and i suppose have that awareness because keto reminds me you know that you know we didn't get to where we are by ourselves and some days you can have those off days like all of us do you know, where you do yeah. need that reminder um, mm-hmm. that, you know, you've had a lot of help in this. And, yes. you know, I remember even, you know, in the pursuits with mind, body and soul, you know, God just saying to me, you know, I don't mind you doing this. I just want to be involved with it because anything is helping people. I want to be involved in this. And, um, you know, I, I completely agree with what you were saying to, to remain humble in it and it's it's one thing I, I always say that you know we've got to do what we can and god's going to do what god can obviously and uh, like you're saying there's that practice there's honing your skills there's your talents and everything yes. that's there um and it is i mean it's, it's an incredible partnership that that comes along and i'm loving obviously being able to share a different aspect of my own journey um in that in in this interview we, we, we you today um because i think it's something that a lot of people forget and they think oh well it's just me 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 and it's like, well, do you not realize that there's been all these intricate parts on your journey that has actually Absolutely. led you to, to, to where you are? Scott, obviously, in every journey that we go through, there's going to be hard times. Um, what were some of your hardest struggles that you had to kind of overcome, I suppose, after you began music and you, you, you started doing a lot more performances? What were some of the struggles that you faced? Again, a great question. <laughs> Um, well, look at things very differently on this show. Well, you know, I'm, I'm glad that, you know, I didn't have the question sent to me. I quite like <laughs> the idea of not knowing what the question is because, you know, when it, it's quite good to answer what, what came into my mind first yeah. when you said rather than a planned answer because yeah. I didn't have, I didn't know what you mean. All and, of my guests seem to enjoy that. My, what came into my mind was that there's a phrase and it's, it's not in the Bible, but it's a great phrase. Um, it says, feel the fear and do it anyway. Mm-hmm. Yes. We have that? Yeah, yeah. I can't remember or, how or, or, said that, actually. Or they say, feel the fear and do it anyway, or do it afraid, right? So if your option, and people may be surprised at me when I say this, because mm-hmm. what often happens with people, you look at people like, like you sitting mm-hmm. there talking to me, people may look at me at times on a stage and they think they've got it all together. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. What a lot of rubbish. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because it's funny that the people that are doing the interviews and things are sometimes, like myself, the most anxious, nervous people. And I was saying to a lady this morning, I said, it's far easier being the one being interviewed than it is doing the interviews because you've got to remember so sure. much. Yes, yes. So so, so what I was meaning by that is, I, I mean, I've, I've never been one of these people who is like, I'm not like really afraid and, and like intimidated. Yeah. But I would say this, and I think this is maybe quite important to say, maybe to people who are listening. I have, I have done lots of things over my years in my career that if I had had allowed myself, fear would have stopped me doing it. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a fantastic even, point there, Scott. Even even somebody like myself, which if I stopped the, the average person who knows me, they would just think, oh, Scott, he's an optimistic, upbeat, confident person. 
And they would never know that occasionally I've had battles of what am I doing here? You're at the side of stage ready to go on and you're like, and so I would say that there's actually a very famous quote again, I'm sure it was a president of America, is it Roosevelt? Mm -hmm. um, I may have this wrong, but he said, there's nothing to fear but fear but itself. Fear itself, yes. So we're all, me, John, whoever's mm -hmm. listening, we know the taste of fear in our lives at times, but I would say, you know, push through that. Do not let that intimidate you. Do not let it bind you. Because I have done a lot of things. I've played in many countries. And everything I have done where I may have looked incredibly at ease, I wasn't always <laughs> inside. <laughs> so feel, feel the fear and do it anyway. I, I think it's a really important thing because one of the, the piece of advice to, to follow on what you said there that I've lived in my own life is, you know, almost not thinking about it, you know, because when you start thinking about it, and this actually came from a youth weekend yeah. away with our youth group years ago, and it was an adventure weekend away. And basically you get to the end of this adventure course and you've got to basically scoot off and jump into this net. And the net is probably, I don't know, six feet below the ground. And you're thinking, oh, what about... For but I, the first time I went, I was petrified because I have vertigo and I'm scared to death of heights. And, but I quickly learned the second time was just throw, you, throw yourself into it. You know, what's the worst that's going to happen? The net's going to catch you. Um, and that was, you know, for me. But then, you know, other advice that I'd handed to people was, you know, if, if there's an event that's coming up that you're really, really terrified about, remember two things. And for me, it used to be with teaching. So I'd remember you're getting paid. But remember, also, it's only for an hour. Well, you can do pretty much anything for an hour. Um, yes. And then it's done and dusted and you move on to the next thing. Yes. You mentioned yes. a lot about traveling. Um, what was that like for you? All of a sudden, you get the opportunity to start traveling. You know, and again, that was it comes with its own stresses. It comes with its own changes in the mindset and things like that. What was the traveling aspect like for you and the events that you got to perform in? I think I can answer that really well. Can I just say, just a wee tag on to the oh, last answer, just a yeah, little yeah. bit. Um, I, I I do enjoy what I do, so don't get any. No, no. <laughs> you know, it's, I, I'm I'm not like, petrified on stage. I was just making the point yeah, yeah. that there was the odd thing I've done um, that you feel a bit out of your depth or something. Yeah, and and then you can put these uh, principles in. Like you've said, and I agree with that. Don't overthink it. You're talking about mm -hmm. analyzing something. That that can be a killer. Oh, yeah. Don't overanalyze. Just do it. So back to the other uh, question, because I love music. And one of the things about traveling, you said there, it can be quite stressful. I've got to say, John, for me, I don't find traveling stressful in any shape or form. Okay. I'm, I'm possibly one of the best travelers <laughs> because... <laughs> And this is a great thing. If any of you listening to this, you may get something out of this. For many years, I've been like this. If I was going to London to play over the weekend or something like that, my attitude is the minute I leave the door of my house, I, I move into that excited mode. I, I don't wait till I get to my mm -hmm. destination before I feel excited. The, the first step from leaving my house is an adventure. And I when we come into this world, we come in with a sense of awe and wonder, believing that things will work out for the best, filled with excitement. We play like children and we enjoy our lives. But as we get older, we found out that everything maybe isn't as rosy as we first thought it would be. Live life long enough and you realize that what once seemed like happy families can very quick turn into dungeons and dragons. Have you ever experienced anxiety, worry, or maybe even fear on an insane level? I want to let you know right here, right now, that you're not alone. Everything from homelessness, betrayal by my best friend, abandonment from the people that I thought would have my back. In fact, I've experienced so many different situations to tell you all would take a very, very long time indeed. 
But the good news is I'm here to tell you that, well, they've left their mark on me. I've come through all of them. There is a light at the end of the tunnel. And I've got a brand new book. It's called The Battles That We All Face. This book is designed to give you encouragement. It's designed to give you hope. It's designed to teach you, to challenge you, to get you to think a little bit more. The full title is The Battles We All Face, a devotional with a difference. Because I don't want you to just read it from start to finish. I want you to take time over this. I want you to read the first chapter and really process it. This book is designed, if nothing more, as I said, to challenge you, to encourage you, to give you hope, but ultimately to let you know that whatever you're facing, you, my friend, are not alone. I want to encourage you right now to not let fear or the past stop you from living an amazing, amazing life. Each page in this book has one of my art pieces in it and has been specifically placed there to give you, the reader, an association to the subject discussed. Please don't delay. You owe it to yourself to start rebuilding your life. Life is not over until you draw your last. Don't delay. Order today. Life is short. You owe it to yourself, as long as you're drawing breath, to stand up and fight for the things that you want in life. And my friend, you've got an ally in me who understands completely what you're going through. Have an awesome day. Click that link below, and I'll see you on the other side. actually on purpose say this is an adventure and I actually and you know it's made me love traveling I've mm -hmm. traveled for years I feel very privileged to have traveled for years and um both my wife and I I must say I'm married I've got two children two granddaughters um they're all beautiful <laughs> um but and I've traveled many many times over the years with my family obviously in, in family holidays mm -hmm. with my wife but but as a musician I've actually traveled a lot of times on my own and I love it because one of the things about traveling on your own that does if you travel if I travel my, my wife you're together all the time and I probably wouldn't talk to the person across the aisle uh -huh. or the person sitting across from me at the airport lounge or if I'm on, like I've been before on the boat to to see the Statue of Liberty on my own, so I'll talk to somebody who's next to me because you're talking to the person you're with. Yeah. And that act alone has made me friends for life. Seriously, I've got friends for life that I've met on an airplane, I've met in an airport, I've met on a boat because I'm going to talk to you mm -hmm. because I don't have someone next to me who I know. And that's a so really incredible many, thing. Yeah. I've had many an adventure. And honestly, get, if you're traveling, people who are stressed when they travel, they don't think it's an adventure. They think when they hit their destination, the adventure mm -hmm. starts. No, it starts the minute you leave your house en route. And, and uh, I have done it on purpose. I've thought, who can I speak to today? Who can I talk to today? And I'm not even talking about necessarily like witnessing about the Lord. Mm -hmm. I'm just talking about just in general, being chatty, being courteous, being, being you know, just being yeah. nice to someone. And um, John, I can tell you f f stories. I remember being in Houston, Texas, played in, in a big, huge cafe, 2003. And a girl walked in, I'd never met before in my life. Her name's Annie Johnson. She walked in with a friend, sat down, got a cup of coffee, heard my last two or three songs, she came right up to me. I'd never met her before in my life. She said, there's a huge concert three blocks from here. Pack up your stuff, follow us, we'll see if we can get you on. Never met her wow. before in my life. 2003, Annie and I are great friends to this day. I was in Houston, Texas last year, 2019. Mm -hmm. Annie picked me up from the airport. That's an adventure. That's when you see when you you have your mindset is who can mm -hmm. I speak to today? Who can I draw in? Don't be, you know, people at arm's length. Be welcoming. 
and and uh, I just said that an example when I said about the Statue of Liberty story. I was on the boat. I had I had like a bit of free time. I was yeah. on my own in New, New York. I went. I thought I want to go to Statue of Liberty. There was an old an older lady. I'll say older lady. She looked about seventy five. <laughs> She was on her own. I was on my own. I just said, "How are you doing?" You know, no, no. Get, I've always got business cards. Da, 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 da. We spoke for like twenty minutes. I kid you not, I'd never met her before in my life. So after I get back home, she sent me an email. She was in Indiana, I think. So I'm back home in Scotland. So we kept in touch. About a year later or something, I'm playing in Wisconsin, and she said, "Scott, on that day you're there. I'm going to be a hundred miles from you." That lady at 75 drove 100 miles to see me playing. Wow, that's incredible. I met, her, I met her for 20 minutes on a boat in New York. That's have an adventure. I think have have a mindset yeah. that's open that I'm actually potentially having an adventure here. So um, I don't know if that's really answering your question, but I think it's, it's a good point that I think a lot of people stress out about traveling. Mm-hmm. And you, and you forget, you've got a great opportunity to meet yeah. new friends. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it's one of the amazing things, because again, I, I completely agree with you. Whenever I step out the door, you know, don't get me wrong, sometimes with the airport security, just because of the, the generic layout of it, it makes me uneasy. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, I, I was in the United States in 2012, and one of the, the, I look back now, funniest but scariest at the time was in Chicago, being patted mm-hmm. down by these ginormous brick privy sized uh, security guards with AK 47s, and I'm really ticklish. So, you know, I'm, I'm standing there trying not to laugh as this big burly guy is basically tickling the heck out of me. But, you know, Good. like you say, you meet people on planes, um, you know, and, and stories that they tell and stories that they share. Mm-hmm. Talk there about mindset in particular, and we've had other guests on, uh, Al Snow being one of them, that talks a lot about mindset and you know, how that really, really changes so many things when you actually have a mindset that says yes to life and that's open to things yes. as opposed to, yeah. no, I want to keep you away and, and, and you yeah. know, closed off to everything in life. And it's, yes. it is such a powerful thing, uh, like you said, to have that mindset. But, but obviously from you just having that mindset of saying, yes, you know, I, I want to go to, to these different places in Houston, that opened up, you know, humongous opportunities for you elsewhere, which was incredible. Well, you'll see, see last year, I, I don't know if I actually, excuse me if I didn't answer the okay. question properly, but last year, for example, I was in Houston, Texas, I hadn't been for 10 years mm-hmm. to, to Houston, and I actually had the privilege of playing in a women's prison. I had never played wow. in a women's prison in my life. I had played, I played in some jails, some prisons over the years, mm-hmm. Um I say to people, I've played like everything for jail, churches to jails, and I have really. It's been that kind of, I've had that kind of life. Uh, but I played in a women's prison. And, John, honestly, it was a highlight of my life wow. as far as as far as far concerts. If you would said to me, that, that would be one of the first that would stand out in my mind. What was one of the greatest concerts you've ever played? Because there was only maybe about 80, 90 mm-hmm. people there, but but you'll know yourself if you've got 90 people in a in a room that looks full. Yeah. Now you could have 90 people in a huge room and it doesn't look that much. It does but, something to you psychologically as well. Yeah. When it's full. Yeah. So so it was a great size of room for that amount of people. The PA was great. That's one thing about American prisons that I've noticed playing in. They have a PA system, they have Prisoners assigned to look after mm-hmm. you. They can run the PA system. It sounds amazing. <laughs> <laughs> they know what they're so, doing. <laughs> they do know what they're doing. So um, it was just great. And uh, I'm looking out at all these. It was actually white boiler suits. You know, in America, okay. you often see them with orange. I don't yeah. know if it was just that prison. They had little white boiler suits. Okay. And you're looking out and... I mean, obviously, let's not be kidding. It was a women's prison. They were probably excited a bit. There's a male inter- <laughs> entertainer coming in to sing and a male entertainer from Scotland. I'm not yeah. from America. So there may have been a degree of interest in that mm-hmm. for by anything else. But it was like, from the first song, it was like electrifying. That's awesome. That really is some of the songs that you've written, um, again, you know, and you do such a wonderful job as well. 
I suppose talk us through maybe one or two that you particularly think of as emotionally charged songs, things that have gone on in your life that that has really been the story of the specific song. Well, um, actually, with that, there's probably a few, John. Let mm-hmm. me think. Um, again, the, the one that came to my mind, you know, immediately when you said it, um, I don't know if it's an emotionally charged song, but it's a song that a lot of people really like. It's one of these, um, it's actually called, I'm actually bringing the, the subject of fear back in here, okay. so it's maybe a good thing that I do, but the song, excuse me, the song is actually called like the best, she's fearless. Yes. I seem to remember you, yeah, I remember you performing that when we were gigging together. Okay, so it's called Like the Best, She's Fearless. So here's a little bit of insight into a songwriter's mind. So I was I was actually, I remember where I wrote the, the lyrics. I was in Wisconsin. I've been in Wisconsin uh, seven different trips. I've been very fortunate. But my first ever trip, I was reading a music magazine. Yeah, I, I quite like when music magazines re- review someone's album. Yeah. And and the journalist was reviewing, I think she's a Norwegian singer, and I think her, her, the title, her, I think the pronunciation is Licky Lee. I think okay. that's her name. Right. And I, I, I didn't really know her music, but I was just reading the review of her album. And the journalist said of her, like the best, she's fearless. Right. And and to a, I think to a songwriter or a poet, that's like a gift. Mm-hmm. Like the best, she's fearless. The perfect title. So um, so that kind of jumped out. So I wrote like six verses. Thankfully, they're not all in the final <laughs> song. But I wrote I wrote like six verses, and I kind of edited to the best. Um, and that came out of just that one phrase in an article. Right. But what I did, I was in Wisconsin for the first time, and I actually, I was staying with a friend of mine, Marsha Brown, and her husband, and she had her niece, who was Gina Cook. Gina was like trying to arrange gigs for me. So I was with those two women quite a bit during that 10 day period with all the gigs I was doing. So I kind of loosely based the lyrics on them. It wasn't like biography, <laughs> you know, bio, biographical, is that the one? That's the one. Um, yeah. So I took the title and I kind of loosely based it on those two women, but it's became a song that a lot of people like. Mm-hmm. And what I like about that song is when I play it, I think there's something about the word fearless it's like a word, it, it sounds fearless, just yeah. the word. It like convey, the meaning is conveyed in just the saying of the word. So I normally always, when I f- sing that song, you feel a degree of empowerment, not f- just for you, but for mm-hmm. the listeners. And I've actually had situations where you feel, you know, the, the Bible talks about death and life are in the power yeah. of the tongue. So you can speak life or you can speak death. Yeah. And when I'm I'm singing that in whatever situation, you're singing life over people. Yeah. So that 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 is one that I would definitely say. Another song is a, uh, which is probably my favorite song that I've ever written. It's called "She's Coming Home," mm-hmm. and it is totally fictional. There's not any truth in it, um, but I wrote it. I have a daughter and I have a son. Uh, And I didn't write it about my daughter in any shape or form. But as life has gone on, there's there's the odd line in the song that makes me think of of my my daughter and her circumstances and some things she's actually been through. Although at that time she would be young when I wrote it, it was nothing to do with her. So... um, that's probably quite an emotional song, you'd say. There's an emotional thread, but yet it was written fictionally. Yeah. It wasn't written with any particular person yeah. in mind. That's called She's Coming Home. By the way, if anybody's listening, She's Coming Home is on the 10 Miles Tall album, which is called Sometimes I Dream in Colour, which you, you'll probably be able to get that track somewhere. Um, and like the best, she's fearless. Definitely be able to download that if you want. 
It was on the Burning Days album from 2012. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, well, those two come to mind. I could probably speak all day about songs, yeah. John, because I, I am I'm a lyricist more. I mean, I've written many songs. Yeah. The you know the tune the whole thing and collaborated uh-huh. with people, but but first and foremost I would be a lyricist. So I cu- I generally put music to lyrics I've already written. Yeah. So generally with my songs the lyrics mean something. Mm-hmm. I'm not just trying to get a catchy hook and what words would work. I'm generally coming from I mean just to maybe finish on that one yeah, just yeah. bringing it right up right up to date. On Saturday, we were in a studio in Glasgow, SG Productions, Mm -hmm. and uh, one of the songs we recorded was called Beautiful Inside and Out. I know the the lady who started the charity called Beautiful Inside and Out, and and there was tragic, tragic circumstances that led to, I'm not going into it all, tragic circumstances that led to the starting of that charity. And I basically took the name of the charity and a, a loose, well, not so much loosely, but not 100%, but a lot of it is based on the person that yeah. died that, that was the, the foundation for the charity starting. Yeah. So that is bang up to date. I just wrote that a little while ago. Excuse me, we just recorded it on Saturday. That will be out for Christmas. Mm-hmm. And that is, that is really... Uh, that is an emotional song. Yeah. Um, but but there again, I'm getting into maybe a little bit more arrangement here, but what I didn't want with that song, I didn't do a hundred percent about the story. I, I, I gave myself a little bit of license mm-hmm. and I also wanted there to be hope and, and, you know, I didn't want it to be dark. So it's not like a sad song. And also I've got a young girl and she came in sing it, just 16 year old and we're going to make it kind of a bit poppy or a bit yeah. like urban and it will be very current in its sound. So I didn't want it to be without hope. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And, and I think it's a really good point that you make in terms of what we speak out in into life, because I know, you know, I, I went through a bad patch, you know, that, that seemed to last forever, um, you know, over the last four years. And it was, it's only looking back in hindsight that you really hear what you were saying and, and, and how you're behaving and, and all the other things and the darkness that you spend your time in. And then when you come out into the other side, the, the language changes oftentimes as well. And, and doing these podcasts for me has certainly been a very, very positive thing. Um, and, and, and it is, I mean, it, it's fantastic. Um, and this, I know a lot of people laugh about this, but this to me is more my niche than anything else that I do. Cause I just like to sit, talk and, and teach and, and, and have a good time, uh, you know, in, in, in doing that. But it's you're, it's, very, very, you're very natural, John, at it. Very thank natural. you. And it feels that way. And I was talking with a, a gentleman yesterday and I thought, oh, I'm going to be really, really nervous. He's a former professional wrestler and he's quite a big deal and all these things. And as soon as I sat down here and clicked that record button, I was as relaxed as a kitten drinking warm milk, you know, and it That's was great. just so easy. And the, the thing about the podcast that I think people are, are gathering now um, is that we don't just want to ask the same questions that every single person asks, because you know the answers to that. You can go and look at them on YouTube. We want to go deeper into, you know, where was the emotion there? Where was the heart there? Where, where was everything else that was there? Um, and I believe I've been told by now several people, we are one of three podcasts worldwide that seem to do this, which is quite extraordinary. Um, and I, I'm somewhat right. amazed at that. Um, you know, and it's, it is an amazing thing. And like you were saying there with, with songwriting, I just want to touch on that a little bit uh, to, to go a little bit further because there are certain songs that we write that we think, you know, and, and again, you can never tell what's going to be a hit and what isn't. It's often down to the, the, the people. Um, there was a song that I wrote for my last album, um, which was called The Memory Road. And it was very, very raw, very, very, uh, you know, just, and it was home recorded basically. And, and just my own thoughts, my own music. There was a song in there called Guardian Angel. And when we were doing the live events for COVID, uh, when the or whole, basically the whole world went into lockdown, um, I think I, I sat down with my wife and I said, right, what can we do now as the, this crazy public figure that people see me as? 
um, to actually really, really help people. So we started doing weekly live concerts for, gosh, maybe about six or eight weeks. And every single time people would ask, you know, end the show with Guardian Angel and things. Um, and it talks about that comfort that's there, that somebody's watching over you and, and everything, which I think now more than ever, I think people are needing to hear more than anything. Scott, I want yes. to ask you as well, uh, where are things at for you now? Obviously, you're coming out the other side. Uh, you're still obviously very, very busy with songwriting and teaching, like we spoke about off the air. But how has COVID-19 obviously affected you and travel music uh, and everything, basically? Well, obviously, there's no live gigs, so I'm not playing anywhere live. Mm -hmm. um, I can't put on any events for any my, my youngsters to play in front yeah. of an audience. Uh, the only thing I've done live is I have played at a few nursing homes okay. in the better weather, and I've been outdoors, you know, on their inside. Yeah, that's the only thing I've done by way of any kind of live entertainment. Now, a lot of other musicians have done quite a lot of live streaming. Mm -hmm. In in fact, in fact, tomorrow night I'm actually on. Uh, sometimes I've done live stream for a venue or for a, a, a bar or a hotel or something. And so I'm doing one tomorrow night. I did one a week ago for, uh, you know, a store, a store in, in America that you could get now the wonder of technology. You can, you can add men, get they may have had men for their page and do it live from their page. Yeah. So, but no, I'm no, we can't, sadly we can't do, and it doesn't matter how, confident you are yeah. if you're in your room in your own singing to a phone it ain't the same it isn't it isn't and even if you get people messaging me as a bit of banter it's still not the same you you need a, a long for the days when we go back to gigs and there's actual people there yeah who you can see the white of their eyes and you can actually look at people's faces when you're playing uh that's that's one of the things we need and it will come back mm -hmm. um so yeah, that's affected me, affected my work life, affected my business. Uh, you know, back to the teaching thing, I've lost some people, gained some other people. Um, and I, I am actually a bricklayer to trade. You may or may not know that. <laughs> I so did. I knew that at, one, yep. At, at, at this moment in time, I'm thankful, thankful I'm in a position where I don't need to do this. Yep. But um, just the other week there, a, a, a guy that I know asked me, he offered me, some work is sort of like an ongoing project. So I've ended up doing about two and a half days a week physical work, helping out at this big wall. Okay. Um, but it's not ideally what I want to do. But we've all got time in our hands. I'm a self-employed businessman. Mm -hmm. I've got time in my hands that I don't normally have. Why not go and make some money doing something else? So, Absolutely. So that's where I am just now. Um, but what I would say, the the whole process. It, so the whole period of time has been incredibly creative for mm -hmm. me, John. That's good. I'm, I'm, honestly, I've had a real creative, it's been locked down and yeah. all these things. But I've actually written a lot of songs that I would say are good songs. Mm -hmm. um, I've written a lot of songs in my life and they're not all good, <laughs> but I've actually wrote, written a lot of good songs. In fact, I, I sat down one day and, I, and I, I wrote them all down and there's like an album's worth of good material that really? sort of just came out of this time. And a, a, a guy approached me, American artist Bradley Sperger is his name. Okay. And he, at the beginning, beginning of like a lockdown and he asked to write songs with me. He's a young guy, he's about 27. Really? And we have written we have written five songs together. Mm -hmm. In fact, the first one that we've co-written, because he's an artist over there. The first one that we've co-written comes out, I think, on the 2nd of November. It's called A Second Try. Brilliant. So that's so we've written five songs together only through this yeah. Yeah. Uh, period of time. So it's, you know, a lot of good things come, come out of difficult times. Yeah. So that's been, that's been something that's been very positive for me, I would say. I think it's really, really good and something to really remind people of because I know for us, you know, and for so many other people, um, you know, if you're able to adapt and you're able to adjust, you're going to survive, you're going to do well. And it was Darwin that said it said it best. Um, and I know for us, this has been a record year for art sales. I mean, we, we were in, in some ways like contingency plan 
A, B through to Z. And, you know, within, I think, three days of COVID-19 hitting, we were having order after order after order. In a 12-week span, we ended up with 50 custom pieces of art during lockdown, which was amazing. Wow. And we sat that's there and I was like, I mean, that's a blessing from God. Yes. It, yes. it was incredible. Uh, and obviously all the stuff that, that's, that's um, unfolded as well. Scott, is there anything else that you want to touch on that we've maybe not chatted about today before we wrap up today's show? I don't, I don't think so, John. I think, um, you know, it's, it, it's been a real honour to come on and talk to you. I say you've been very, very natural. Thank you. Um, <laughs> no, it's, it's been great. And, and I, I really feel honoured to, to have been on your show. I don't, I don't, there's not anything particularly burning that I, I particularly want to feel I need to say. That's all good. It's but all good. Happy to... <laughs> Scott, I was going to ask, um, if folks want to get in touch with you, check out your CDs and your music, where can they find you? Well, I've, I've got a lot of social media presence. And I, but probably go to my website would be the best, which is just www.scottnickel. That is two T's in Scott, and it's N-I-C-O-L. So it's scottnickel.us. Okay. Uh, you, you'll get me on Scott Nickel Music on Facebook. You'll get me on Scott Nickel Music on Instagram. You'll find me on Twitter, Scott Nickel 101. <laughs> and I'm also in SoundCloud. And I've also got a YouTube channel at Scott Nickel TV. So there's plenty of places to find me. I, I'm, I'm on Spotify. I'm on iTunes. I'm probably on Amazon and other places. <laughs> <laughs> you'll find me. And that's fantastic. Basically, if you look for Scott Nickel music, you're going to find Scott somewhere. And it's been an absolute blast to chat with Scott. Um, I definitely, definitely recommend you go check out his music because it's just incredible. A real feel of Scottish music as well that will speak to you and that you'll really, really enjoy. And again, that's, you know, Scott Nickel. You've got to go and check it out. And of course, if you're into reading right now and you're looking for things to pick up, you can check out my brand new book that's going to be out October 30th called The Battles We All Face. If you're struggling with trauma, depression, or just want to know that you are not alone, then it's definitely the book for you. Hence the name, The Battles We All Face. You can purchase it at thebattlesweallface.com. And there's even signed options as well over there. So go and check that out. Until next time, folks, this has been the Mind, Body and Soul podcast, where we help you find the balance in the craziness of day-to-day -day life. Oh, Scott's got something. Go for it, Scott. Go on. Just one thing. Sorry, just before Go for it. you do that <laughs> final sentence. Um, the two songs we were recording at the weekend, one of them's called In Future Fields. It was actually written by a 12-year-old girl, Sophie Henderson, because she wrote it about, you know, the, the old poem In Flanders Fields? Yes, yeah, yeah. She, she flipped it to the In Future Fields and she won Poppy Scotland competition. Wow. So so that song will be out just before Remembrance Day on the, if you see it, mm -hmm. Buy it, please. Uh, you know, some of the proceeds is going to Poppy Scotland. Um, that's called In Future Fields. And the other song, Beautiful Inside and Out, will be by Shan Clark. And that will be out for Christmas, probably about December. So that th yeah, that's the newest yeah. stuff that's coming out. And thanks yeah. again, John. No, no, pleasure, pleasure. And definitely go and check them out, folks, because you are supporting some really awesome causes, helping a lot of people. Um, through doing that and again we want to thank Scott so much for being on uh, the Mind, Body and Soul podcast where we help you find balance through the craziness of day-to-day -day life through inspirational, hey. motivational and encouraging content. Until next time, take care, God bless and I'll see you soon.